Welcome. Welcome to this session on bargaining with the devil. My name is Katja Tiedemann. I'm a professor uh, on negotiation and conflict management at the Verich Business School. Um, I constantly try to combine the good conceptual best practices with the real life practical experience and make that bridge. And that's also what we will be talking about today, uh, because as you as lawyers uh, constantly have to at the, have to face that question in practice. What do we do when we encounter an opponent that is very tough with us, that betrays us, that makes our lives very hard? That's the question. I start with a question to you. Who are the people you see on the picture? And why are they with us today? Any ideas? Churchill and Mandela, I see the right answer coming already from the first uh, participant, Rainer Casper, uh, Churchill and Mandela indeed. Why should they be with us today? What is, what is the, the link with the topic of today? Good negotiators, uh, definitely. Uh, also very different negotiators. And we'll come back to that question. We'll come back to the question on why Churchill and Mandela are with us today. Okay, well, we'll focus today on the question on when to negotiate and when to fight. And again, uh, I will try to involve you and your experience. There's a lot of experience across the group of participants. And I'll ask you the following. President Obama, in his, uh, in his last days of, of presidency at the moment, asks for your advice. Should we attack Syria or negotiate with IS? What, what is better? Uh, the current approach of, of not really choosing, really attacking full-fledged, or negotiating with IS? What would you recommend? Give that some thought, and we'll come back to the question. Exactly that question, my colleague Robert Manukin, author of the best-selling management book and director of the Harvard Program on Negotiations, found himself facing in uh, communication with the White House. He was asked by the White House to advise them on their strategy in Afghanistan, with a lot of similarities to the current challenges in Syria. And he was asked, should we negotiate with the Taliban, or should we fight them? What would be better? It's a question we all face regularly when we're betrayed, when we're hurt, when we're sort shortchanged. What do we do? Do we fight or do we negotiate? Often the answer people give is rather categorical. It's rather categorical in the sense that either the protagonist of negotiations decides that you should always try to negotiate. You have nothing to lose. You should always try to, try to find a, a solution by problem solving, uh, by finding an interest based approach. Um, and negotiation doesn't mean you give in. It just means that you're trying to find a solution that is better than your non-negotiable alternatives. That's what the protagonists say. On the other hand, the opponents have a different story. They say you should never negotiate with the devil. You sell your soul. Think about the Faust analogy. The devil is smart and scrupulous, and he tempts to uh, set you up with something you desperately want and make you give up your integrity. So uh, you should never do that. Think about a former Vice President Dick Cheney who said, I've been charged by the President in order to make sure that none of the tyrannies of this world are ever negotiated with. We do not negotiate with evil. We fight it or we defeat it. And so you have these two camps uh, that have, have, uh, have strong cases each. What, what can we get out of this? Um, well, actually, they're both right. They're both right depending very much on the example you choose. Uh, who are your biggest heroes of the 21st century? Or the 20th century, let me start there. Who are your biggest heroes of the 20th century? If you think about examples, role models in terms of negotiation, who are your biggest examples? I see nothing coming in yet. Gandhi, now you see Gandhi appearing. Huh? Um, Atatürk, I see, uh, pairing, uh, Mustafa Kemal, uh, I see a lot of, of Lech Walesa, uh, I see a lot of different, different ideas. And actually, if we look at reality, then the, the, the kind of choice is a bit more complex. How can we make the right choice if both are right? Uh, because let's look at, at Churchill and Mandela, our examples we started with. Two examples, two role models that often come back uh, in answer to this question. 
Churchill in, in May 1940, dark days for the UK. Huh? France is about to capitulate. The US is not yet involved. Mussolini offers to mediate between the UK and Nazi Germany. Huh? There are five days of internal meetings, very difficult discussions the UK is facing. Should they actually take that offer or should they, should they not? Should they fight? And Churchill decides not to negotiate. He didn't want to negotiate with what he considered evil, with Nazi Deutschland or with, with Hitler. Uh, so he decides not to negotiate. If you look at the other picture, Mandela, after 20 years of prison, uh, the ANC against negotiation, so not backing him up, he starts secretive negotiations with the apartheid regime, the devil. Okay? And he said, I decided it was time to initiate negotiations, and I did not ask, because I, know that the, I knew that the answer was going to be no. And so both turned out, in hindsight, to be right. Uh, and that, that presents us with a problem, because if both decisions are perfectly defendable, how can we make, my, how can we make wise decisions without categorical guidelines? A wise decision, Manukin says in his book, is actually based on, three, on addressing three main challenges. The first one is, you should make a sound, very correct, cost-benefit analysis of the situation. A second one is, you should make sure you avoid the psychological and emotional traps. Okay? And the third one is, you should definitely take, it, definitely take into account both the ethical and the pragmatical side of the argument. So three important guidelines. And let's have a look at what that means, how that can guide our own decisions, your decisions as lawyers, when you're facing very tough opponents, when you're facing the devil. Because benefit analysis that Manukin uses in his book is actually inspired by what he calls the, the Mr. Spock, uh, known to all of us, I think, uh, Mr. Spock metaphor. And the, the questions Mr. Spock would be asking, so very much the rational side of things. Okay? What are the stakes? What are the alternatives to negotiation? If we don't negotiate, what are the alternative for, alternatives we're facing? And what are the possible solutions that meet the stakes uh, of the parties involved that are better than the alternatives? What is the chance that the agreement, if we negotiate, will actually be implemented? Because negotiation, in the end, you do to get a different agreement. How high are the implementation chances? What is the cost of negotiation? Important question. And what is your best alternative? And is it legitimate and morally defendable? That's the question he asks. And actually, if we start applying this to Afghanistan, to have a bit of, of time loop, so we can look back, back from, from hindsight, and, and how Manukin himself, when he was asked by the White House, evaluated these questions, we get the following situation or the following response. What are the stakes for the US? Protect American civilians, avoid future terrorist attacks. For the Taliban, remain, remaining in power, uh, enforce the Islam law. Uh, what are the alternatives for the negotiation? If you don't negotiate, what do you do then? For the US, a military intervention uh, or isolation, retreatment. For the Taliban, guerrilla fighting. Uh, are these Possible solutions that meet the stakes of the parties involved better than the alternatives? Important question. Huh? The Clinton administration attempted to negotiate the shutdown of the training camps and extradition of bin Laden, and the Taliban wasn't able or willing to live up to this deal. Right? So a, a negative there as well. If you look at the, the, the next series of questions, what is the chance that the agreement will be implemented? Well, in Manukin's view, rather low. Right? So another Another negative. Um, and what is the cost of negotiation for Manukin High? Uh, because there was, the Taliban wasn't an innocent partner. Uh, they tolerated and even supported terrorists. And the Clinton administration publicly warned the Taliban that they would be held responsible for, for terrorist attacks. Uh, so the question is now, um, what happens to US credibility if we start negotiating nevertheless? Um, is the best alternative morally defendable? Also a very important question. Uh, according to Manukin, it was. Bin Laden declared, declared war on the US and so uh, justified a military response. Okay? So Manukin's advice to the White House was clear. Based on that cost-benefit analysis on these Spock-inspired questions, his advice was, we should not negotiate with the Taliban. Okay? But does this always apply? Okay, let's look at some examples closer to home, more familiar to us. Suppose you're the CEO of a high-tech company. You have a joint venture of five years with a Japanese firm that produces and distributes medical, distributes medical tools on the Japanese and Asian markets. 
China isn't part of the agreement and your partner isn't allowed to sell competing products there. Okay? You find, you find out your partner uh, secretly sells a very comparable product in China, cheating under the license agreement. When confronting your partner, you get a kind of phlegmatic response, showing no remorse. Okay? He even denies breaching the agreement and argues you don't understand the Chinese market anyway. Okay? The royalties you're asking, eh, in, according, in accordance to the agreement eh, with the market, um, are, not, are not given by him. Eh? And he requests even to renegotiate the current, the current agreement. Your natural response eh, in such a situation is very logically, you feel shocked, you feel deceived, and your instinct tells you to fight to sue your partner. But is that the best decision? Is that the, best, is that the smartest answer? Uh, financially, rationally, and morally? That's the question. Are you dealing with the devil? Who is the devil? I'm going to ask you to auction with me. And I'm going to auction actually a bill of 20 euros. Everybody can participate. Feel free to participate. You can bid in multiples of one euro until no further bidding occurs. The highest bidder will pay the amount she, amount she or he bids and win my 20 euros. The second highest bidder must also pay the amount she or he bids, although she will obviously not win the 20 euros. Okay, for an example, Ada, Anna bids uh, 3 euros, she's the second highest bidder. Peter bids 4 euros, he's the highest bidder. Peter gets 16 euros from me. Okay, 20 minus four. Anna pays me the three euros. So um, you can start now. Let's start bidding. Who wants the 20 euros? Serio, one euro. Christina is typing two euros, if I read this well. Yes, two euros. Frederike, three euros. There's a jump. Felipe, ten euros. Matthias, another jump to 19 euros. Philippe goes to in, in multiples of one, I said. <laughs> Philippe goes to 19.99. So I'll take that as a 20. Anybody else bidding? Matthias, well, Felipe already had the 20, Matthias, because 1999 is not allowed. Eh? So what are you going to do? Anybody else want to interfere at this moment? So at this moment, Felipe has the 20 euros, and Matthias goes to 21. Okay. Felipe, do you still want to respond? Paul says, well, just don't bid. Okay. But I think at this moment, eh, there's a bit of a dilemma. <laughs> Sergio comments, nice business, a eh, nice business model. What happened here? Anybody still wanting to bid? 22. Alexandre goes to, I, re I recommend Philip to go to 22 now. It's cheaper for him. Philip, are you still going to do that or not? Let's wait for one second. But is it still rational to bid at this point? This is fun. <laughs> huh? You should all apply for Christie's CEO. Uh, we get interesting comments here. Uh, and at this moment, we face a situation where, uh, at this moment, uh, we're going to actually have, if I see this correctly, uh, who gets the 20 euros? Can we check quickly who gets the 20 euros? Who made the highest bid? A 22. Yeah. Eh? And uh, Matthias pays the 21. Okay, so Alexander, eh? I get two euros from you eh? if we uh, make the netto exchange, eh? and one from Matthias. Thank you very much for participating. What happens here? Eh, this, it's not quite, quite rational. Eh? You're, paying, actually, you're paying more for a bill than it's worth. Eh? So what, what happens? What happens here? What you see happening is that you get very much trapped into the game. 
you get trapped into the game uh, and you get kind of an escalation. Uh, um, you get an escalation whereby we quickly move beyond what is a rational, an, a rational response. Uh, if we look at, at reality and we see where we see parallels between what we just saw happening here and what you see in negotiation happening, then quickly or very often the triggers to get these kinds of ex escalations are very simple. Uh, it's, it is ego, it is emotion. Uh, it is quick response, uh, um, and it, it actually carries us far beyond rational responses. It's what you see in negotiations, you see it in price wars, you see it in, in uh, international wars and international conflict escalation, but you also see it a lot, I'm, I'm sure you as lawyers see it a lot, in, in uh, attempts to settle or in decisions to go to court, uh, beyond, beyond what, what is rational. And it is very important then that we, we really clearly look at how can we keep that rationality as a guideline? How can we keep Spock as a guideline? Huh? Um, it is, there is this whole dimension of who brings first the competitive elements, huh? the emotional side, the perceptions playing, trick, playing tricks on us. Huh? And you see a lot of, of these things happening. If we then look at who is the devil in that situation, we get, we get a very interesting response. We have a dual decision-making system. If we try to make these quick decisions uh, that you just saw happening uh, in, in, the, in the game we played, in the, uh, the bidding war, um, we have our analytical side, the analytical reasoning, the conscious, systemic, logical, rational side, and we have the more intuitive side, intuitive reasoning, automatic, very quick, very self-granted, very instinctive, very trigger-based, and it's very much geared on survival. Our intuition system is very much geared on survival. Even more, if we look at our brain and the composition of our brain, and we see that the amygdala, which is a, an almond-shaped cluster uh, of small structures near the limbic region of our brain, um, we see that that plays a key role in regulating emotions, uh, our key emotions. And it's a very old part of our brain. If you look back at our evolution, uh, this part of our brain was already there when we still lived in the caves. Uh, so it was, it's a very old part of our brain. Our frontal cortex developed much later, the one that allows us to make analysis. But this one we needed for survival. Because if you lived in the cave and a tiger entered the cave, you could hardly start assessing and making a, a Spock cost-benefit analysis and saying, look, okay, how big is that tiger? How many are we? Uh, can we actually beat him or not? You had to react instinctively and very quick geared on your survival. And that is what amygdala, your amygdala helps you to do. It helps you make a very quick scan and make a decision. Okay? And it, it basically it bypasses your intellect. It takes your intellect hostage. Okay? And it, it tells you to fight or to flight. To fight or to flight. That's at, at that very basic survival mechanism that kicks in. The thing is, it is very efficient for physical survival. But it's not efficient for social situations, for negotiations where much more complex social issues are at stake. There it is often misleading. What we see happening there is that we see we are victim to traps. You have the negative pitfalls that guide you or gear you to fighting, pro-fighting traps. Uh, tribalism, it's very much groupthink, they versus us. Uh, that, that, that escalation dynamic that you get, you get going that way. Uh, demonizing, very clear, a negative pitfall. The other side is not only not only acts evil, but is evil. Okay, you attribute their actions to their personality, to their being. Dehumanization, uh, they're worthless. Uh, they're no longer human. Uh, racism is an example of that. Moralism, uh, convinced of yourself, uh, you are the one who's right, and you you're not open to listen to the other side. Zero assumptions. There is no way to make the pie bigger. There is no way to create value. It's you or me. Okay. Um, and the call to fight that a missionary leader, think about um, Trump, who uh, was very much a missionary leader, and would, if you want to attribute pitfalls to him, it's definitely on this side of the spectrum. Okay. The positive pitfalls, just as dangerous, uh, they're pro-negotiation. They go in terms of universalism, we're all equal. Okay. Whatever, uh, whatever we do, whoever we kill, whoever we hurt, uh, we're all equal, um, and we always rationalize the context. All behavior can be explained, understood, and forgiven by external factors. It's never the fault 
of the aggressor. It's always uh, is, is growing up, the way he grew up, uh, the circumstances, the external triggers. Huh? Uh, rehabilitation, everybody can change and deserves a second chance. Uh, you always have to share responsibility and blame, and we are all equally to blame. Uh, that, that universal peace, peace spirit. Huh? Win-win, the pie can always be enlarged. Conciliation and negotiated agreement is always better uh, than a non-negotiated agreement and a call for peace. The leader makes a call to avoid conflict. Uh, that, that's, uh, if, if you want to attribute uh, pitfalls to Obama, uh, that's probably where many of the Obama or the Clinton camp, uh, there would be probably more on that side. Now, if you want to move beyond those pitfalls and no longer be victim to them, uh, then we should make sure they don't cloud our judgments. And most of us have a clear preference. And, and I think if you read those pitfalls and if you heard me talking about them, you probably recognized yourself uh, immediately. In which camp are you? Huh? Um, and that preference links to our personality, our roots, our deepest identity, our model of the world. A warrior uh, in an unjust world uh, in which people explore each other, explore. Uh, each other with which when given the chance and exploit each other when given the chance huh, is the one model and there is good in every human being uh, we have to look for it is the other model and that, that's the two models we're talking about uh, we have to go beyond these pitfalls to come to a solid judgment and a healthy analysis if I ask you where you belong where would you place yourself in the warriors camp huh? subject easy subject to the pitfalls uh, of not negotiating and fighting or on the appeasement side, and the, let's say the peacemaker, where do you place yourself? Percentages are scrolling here. Huh? Five seconds, four seconds, three seconds, two seconds, huh? one second, and we get a division of 20 point, well, about 20 percent if we if we round it off, huh? uh, in favor favor of warrior huh? warrior uh, choices, and and the other 80. 80 plus percent in favor of a peacemaker. It's no coincidence eh, because you're sitting here, you're sitting in a seminar on negotiation. And so we get a, a bit of a bias. If we do this across the whole population, we get much closer responses to 50 50. Eh, people looking in the mirror recognize themselves. Eh, and somebody says here very, very interestingly, whoa, and that despite the fact that we're lawyers. Eh, so <laughs> there is hope, okay? Um, Let's go back to the joint venture. We talked about that joint venture, remember? Huh? Um, if, we, if we make the analysis on the joint venture, you're betrayed by your Japanese partner. Uh -huh. um, and if we look at the analysis, the spoke analysis, that helps us to move beyond the pitfalls. Which results do we get? Take some possible outcomes. There is common ground. There is room for common ground if we look hard enough. Uh, the alternative, a lawsuit. Mm, very difficult in China, as some of you may know, uh, as an external uh, site. High risk in Japan, unlikely in California, since the company has no operations there. And so your alternatives are weak. That makes you already much more prone to negotiation. But how do you negotiate then? How do you make sure, if you have to negotiate, that you do it in the right way? The paradigm I developed to guide us there is the paradigm of negotiation intelligence. It builds very much on the story of emotional intelligence and IQ, the two building blocks most of you are very familiar with. And NQ actually help us to, helps us to negotiate in a world of high interdependencies. What, how can we make sure uh, we, we strike the right balance there? Um, and there are four keys that you should definitely keep in mind. The first key is the key that helps you to read the room. Okay, not only what's on the table, but also what's not on the table. Uh, so how can you understand the other side? It's really the paradigm shift, if you want to, from knowing to understanding. Big difference. Okay? The second key helps you to unlock value. So it's very much about creating value, rather than just going for the quickest, the quickest response, uh, the, the, the most obvious response. How can you enlarge the pie before dividing it? It's very much the mindset switch that actually tells you that negotiation is not just problem solving. Problem solving is fixing the past. But it should be preparing for the future. It should be uh, taking the opportunity, the fact that you have to invest time into something, and uh, taking that as an opportunity to improve things, to, to, uh, to think creatively about uh, improving things. That's the second key. The third key is very much about making sure you don't become the victim of your cooperative behavior. So how do you make sure that you don't stand in the way of your own success, that you achieve high results? 
that you take your piece of the pie home. That's what the third key is very much about. And the fourth key is about making sure you don't just play the game, but you also shape the game. If you look at your own negotiation reality, you will see that once you start negotiating, once you're at the table with the other side, or the other side, half of the game has already been played. There's lots of leverage in thinking about the shape of the negotiations. Who should be at the table? Which topic should be at the table? How can we make sure we have prepared our own alternative, maybe affected the alternative of the other side? And so the moves away from the negotiation table are just as important as the moves at the negotiation table. And that's, that's a very important one. What is also important is to realize that if you want to negoci negotiate differently, it's not sufficient to know how to do things better. I think all of us know a lot about negotiation. Yet you see a very big gap between knowing on the one hand and doing on the other side, doing in practice, in the hectic of everyday life. And if you want to affect that deeper level as well, you need to think about your mindset. What is your mindset? In the end, your mindset and your skills drive your behavior. So, and the mindset is very much what we just saw in terms of uh, the peacemaker, the warrior. Are you, do you see negotiation as an opportunity or a threat? How do you step into a negotiation? If we really want to change something about our behavior, that's where we have to start. Um, let me ask you a concrete example that, that illustrates some of the keys. That's a very famous example. Who of you has small kids at home? For those of you we have, you will know, you will know the, recognize the situation very easily. Suppose huh, you have two four-year-olds and they both want the last orange in the house. You raised them very well, you educated them very well. They don't want sweets, they don't want cake, they want the last orange in the house. Okay? Um, and they're fighting for it. Mom, I had it first. Dad, I had it first. Okay, what would you actually do as a very uh, responsible parent? Make juice. <laughs> Somebody says, okay, that's one way. Eat it myself. Somebody else wrote recently. Yeah, so, but what most of us, most of us say is divide. Eh? Divide, split the difference. That's the logic of compromise. And it's very much what we're educated in, in the logic of compromise. The thing with compromises is, is that it is easy. I have a two-year-old at home, and, and already he's making compromises all the time. Mama, I, I want the cake. Can I get one? Uh, no. Can I get half, half of a cake? And he then goes. And so the, the logic, it, it's in our genes. We do it all the time. Okay? It's in our DNA. Okay? Uh, the thing with the compromise, it is, it is, the problem is that it's hardly ever sustainable in the sense that people are always halfway happy. Not really happy, but only halfway happy. And so when they get an opportunity to reopen the box of Pandora, they will very often do so. Another problem is that you don't really tackle the symptoms of a problem. You tackle, sorry, you don't really tackle the, the sources of a problem. You tackle only the symptoms. And, and that is, of course, that would make you a very bad doctor uh, if, if you want to draw that parallel. Uh, so if we want to go further, we have to ask, use key one first and ask these kids why they want the urge. Uh, suppose one of the kids, and some of you were thinking in that direction, as some of the kids um, want, uh, of one of the kids wants the juice and the other one wants the skin. One wants to drink the juice, the other wants to bake a pie with skin. Now you could give each of your, each of your kids instead of 50%, 100% of what they want. And in, in the age of scarcity, that's of course a very big asset. Okay? Is it that easy in a business reality? No. Eh? Our interests are never perfectly complementary. But if you start using that, that, that line of thinking, if you start using those moves in negotiations to ask questions before using arguments, you get a very different logic. You get very different results. And, and that is critical in, in making sure you make wise decisions. It is also important to think about negotiations uh, at a systemic level. I'll make the, the parallel with companies. If, if you uh, look at those companies, those organizations that treat negotiations as ad hoc events, you have the good negotiators, and the weaker negotiators. But they're lonely wolves. They do their thing, and, and they succeed or fail. Okay? And you compare that with organizations that think smartly about negotiations. And they're actually going to treat negotiations just like you treat any other important uh, process in your organization with a high top line and a high bottom line impact. Uh, you're going to think about it strategically and systemically. You're going to align each and every negotiation with your company's objectives you get a very different negotiation style. And what you see, actually, is that 
you look at the global 2000 companies, that on average with the last economic crisis, they saw their net income decline with 30.9. However, the ones that have a smart negotiation intelligence strategy saw their income increase with 42.5%. 40 That's a huge gap. And the worst of the class saw their income decline with 63.3%. So it is worthwhile to think if you're working in a broader context, think about negotiations on a systemic level. Of course, we also have a clash between pragmatism and identity. Okay? You can say, I made my cost-benefit analysis, I avoided my traps, and I faced a very difficult situation. What if my analysis tells, you to tells me or you to negotiate, huh? but it contradicts firmly with my personality and with my values, with everything I stand for? Okay? My pragmatic response is yes, yeah, but my, my ethical response is no. And so how do I deal with that dilemma? It's a heartbreaking choice between principle and pragmatism. If you look back at examples, and the book of Manukin uh, contains a, a wealth of very beautiful, very readable stories uh, that are based on real life situations. And one of the stories is about Sharansky uh, versus the KBG. Um, Nathan Sharansky was a Jewish Russian dissident, um, and he was confronted with a very difficult dilemma, the dilemma we just talked about. He was charged with treason, um, and he was accused of passing state secrets to the CIA. But the charges were bogus. What really happened, he was a, his real offense was that he had become the spoke, spokesman in the, in the Soviet Union for the Zionist movement. And in exchange for a confession and a condemnation of the Zionist movement, he was allowed to join his wife in Israel after only a short prison sentence. So pragmatically, many arguments would speak in favor of taking that opportunity, taking that chance to escape. Nine long years, Sransky refused to make any deal with the devil. The KBG was the devil for him, despite interrogations and labor camps. Okay? Um, and he said, I quote him, a feeling that as long as you continue to say no, you are a free person, was his drive. And so he faced, he faced that dilemma and, and very much uh, made a very tough choice there. Um, somebody else facing a very similar dilemma, that was Rudolf Kazinsne. And he was a Jewish leader in Nazi-occupied Hungary during the World, uh, War, World War II. And he chose to negotiate with Adolf Eichmann, uh, one of Hitler's uh, disciples. And um, he actually negotiated with the devil. And in doing so, he freed uh, a lot of lives, a lot of human lives uh, from the Nazis. Um, and and uh, he negotiated again, even several times, and he managed to save a lot of, of human lives. Um, and he was afterwards very much criticized by his own people for it, because of course he had to pay for it. And, he, and, and he, by in doing so, he enabled Nazi Germany to continue to fight, to buy new, to buy new, uh, new arms and to continue fighting. Um, but he made a choice to save people on that spot. Very difficult, very difficult choice. Huh? And very tragical ending also for, for the man. Um, if you look at a wise but painful choice, we see something interesting. Neurologists get more and more insight in how moral judgments are formed. Huh? Um, and often we link back to intuitive processes to do so, shortcuts. We have an instant judgment when we see something happening, a very quick judgment when we see something happening. Short shortcuts, these shortcuts, cuts are the biggest enemy of negotiation and conflict. Why? Because they kill creativity and divergent thinking, thinking out of the box, looking at the full picture, and they lead to assumptions and self-fulfilling prophecies. These moral shortcuts, these judgment shortcuts, are what keeps you from using negotiation intelligence. Okay? So should we then kind of block our intuition? If we had a button that we could just turn off, um, which would then, then uh, turn our intuition off, would that be better? Uh, your intuition is a very important source of information, uh, um, but it should be tested. It's a source of information that should be tested. It should be tested to make sure that you have done your Spock analysis. It should be tested to make sure that you have avoided your pitfalls, uh, be it towards the positive side, negotiate always, or be it towards the negative side. Uh, 
uh, negotiate never in fights. And so as soon as you feel offended. And so it should be really tested towards those two. And, and that, is, that is, I think, a critical difference maker, a critical difference maker uh, between healthy negotiations, good negotiations, sound negotiations, and, and those negotiations where, in hindsight, you feel you've made the wrong choice. Okay. Um, if a contrast remains after you've done the analysis, you need to make a very tough call. You need to make a tough call uh, between, on the one hand, following your judgment, your analysis, your ratio, or following your own um, ethical judgment, your ethical call, your values. And what Manukin does there is actually make a strong call for pragmatism. It's a difficult one. Uh, um, and somebody else uh, suggests here, and the Christian suggests here, can you, can you make somebody else take over the negotiations? Okay. And of course, that helps because you have more distance from the negotiations. And that's your role also very often. Okay? And this is your role because you're not in the case. But you're also on one side. So it, it, it remains a challenge for you to apply all the steps we have been reviewing here. And that, that is, but, but definitely it can be an added value to get that external perspective with exp expertise, uh, uh, carrying expertise uh, on, on the case you're facing. Um, and Spock is that external side that you often have to wake up inside you, uh, but you can, of course, also try to, uh, to create outside uh, by, by getting in um, expertise advice. Um, why pragmatism? Um, painful, uh, because injustice demands more than kind of ut utilitarian or pragmatic uh, analysis. It, it, injustice screams for revenge. Uh, that, that's also... Uh, what, what you experience when people feel hurt, when people feel uh, victimized in a negotiation. What we typically see happening in a negotiation is that victims become aggressors. Yeah, we're usually not Gandhis. We, are not, we don't turn the other cheek. Uh, when, we are, when we feel victimized, we look for payback. Most of us look for payback. And so you often, by victimizing, if you have a longer-term perspective, you create aggressors. Uh, um, but pragmatism still... Because it is about the choice between settling the past, revenge, or preparing for the future. Okay? In the end, that's, that's the choice that you're facing. Okay? Um, to prepare the future, you often have to give the devil something you do not think he deserves. And that's the very hard part, the prize of negotiating, the very hard part in negotiations. Okay? Um, Sacrifice, it's a big sacrifice on the altar of pragmatism, and it can be a very, very bitter pill for people to swallow. In conclusion, should you always negotiate? Should you always negotiate? Huh? Um, no, but much more often than you feel like. Much more often than you feel like or than you would like to. Um, you should keep a strong the advice, the kind of bottom line advice is keep a very strong uh, preference in favor of negotiation in order to defend yourself against the traps. Remember the traps that you, even as an external party, you get carried up, you get carried into the game and that you're a subject to. Um, and, and gain a chance to use negotiations and negotiation intelligence. The burden of proof against negotiation is what that part of you or those around you that do not want to negotiate but want to fight should bring to the table. The burden of proof is on fighting, not on negotiating, in other words. And that's, that's the, the bottom line. Um, I would like to wish you good luck in unmasking the devil, but I would also like to, to use the last 15 minutes to see whether you have any questions left. I saw a lot of reactions coming, uh, coming in while we were um, scrolling the different exercises. Any other questions that you have remaining? Any interesting comments that you still saw, Alexander, at this moment? Uh, not particularly, uh, no, but uh, the chat box is still open. So if you feel, uh, if you want to address some questions or some personal dilemmas maybe that you are facing in your negotiations, this is the time to uh, have an outside view. And while you are posting your questions, also just uh, reminding you that, of course, this webinar is recorded and we will share uh, the, the link to the, the recorded file uh, through your channels uh, after this webinar. Okay. Paul asks where we can get uh, the, uh, the, the slides uh, from the okay, presentation. Okay, we'll add those to, uh, to the pack. 
it is sometimes very hard to see where the borderline is. Eh? So between, Christian writes, eh, uh, you mean the borderline between uh, fighting on the one hand and negotiating on the other? Is that, is that yes? Huh? Um, yes, and, and of course, um, the more assertive you have to be in your negotiations, uh, the more there is an element of fight in your negotiations. I think the critical question remains, are you building what we call in negotiations your BATMA, your best alternative to a negotiated agreement? That means you're trying to build something that you don't need the other side for. Uh, you're trying to go, in your case, very completely to go to court, uh, which is a very different setting from, from the settlement setting. Uh, or are you still trying to focus mainly on the settlement? And that's that's a very different, a very different uh, um, ideology, a very different mindset that you're working with. Um, although uh, there are borderline issues, but but that that mindset is very different. That end end goal is very different. Uh, and of course, you will try to settle and, and have your batna uh, still alive and kicking. Uh, that you should have a batna. You should even reinforce your batna whenever possible. Uh, but the choice is still one between fighting and negotiating. Yes, uh, other questions to get, the, to get the slides, to get the presentation. Uh, we will share the presentation, Absolutely. so no problem there. Yeah. Um, there's another, Serena, in my experience, wait a second, you already, yeah. we're already scrolling, scrolling too fast. Let's have a look yeah. at what you're... Uh. In my experience, usually the kickoff moment is crucial. If the atmosphere is relaxed at the beginning, then it runs in a... Uh, smooth way, would you agree? Yeah. Uh, I think I couldn't agree more. It's a very good remark. Um, the, we see the first moments in a the negotiation, they provide an anchor point for the rest of the negotiations. And that is true both for the atmosphere, the climate, the kind of relational invite that is sent by both sides, but it is also true for the numbers and the proposals you place on the table. They have a disproportionate effect on the rest of the negotiations. And so you should think very, very smartly and very carefully about your anchor. Where do you want to anchor? And make sure you don't censure yourself. You give yourself a chance to do well, because that anchor will influence very heavily the possibilities you will have for the end result. So absolutely. Huh? And I see Christian also outside of court. There sometimes uh, is the question, and we're flipping again. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how much do you tolerate? Huh, in terms yeah. Of, yeah. Yeah. And there, and there, Christian, I think it is essential to make your analysis. Okay, and don't be carried away by emotions. Don't be carried away by um, egos, by competition, by all the triggers we saw, the shortcuts we, we described. It is essential to make that that spoke analysis, and 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 base your choice on that. And so, how much you should tolerate really depends on um, your analysis of your alternatives, but also the importance and the possibilities to settle for something that is more interesting than your alternative. That, that remains a critical, a critical um, decider uh, for, for, uh, for what you should, uh, should do. If you start with a hit, does this help to get a better result in negotiations? Uh, Agatha uh, writes, um, with a hit, what do you mean with a hit? Do you mean a, a tough or a rough uh, movement? Yeah, you might get the risk. Well, you have two dimensions in a negotiation. Huh? You have a relationship dimension and you have an objectives dimension. And if you, uh, you're going in very rough, very dominant, very, uh, very aggressive, uh, the risk is that you're immediately attacking the relationship dimension. And if you need that other side to be able to settle, and usually you do, that's, of course, a high price. So I would advise try to be tough on the issue, hard on the issue, but soft on the people. Assertive on the anchor you're drawing, uh, but very soft and, and inviting and kind in the style you're using. That would be my, my guideline. When being nice does not work, how to avoid blocking the negotiations? Well, I think being nice usually doesn't work, uh, or very often doesn't work. And, and really, I would again make that distinction. Uh, separate the people from the problem. Soft on the, prob on the people, hard on the problem. Assertive on the problem. Um, so you can set the tone by by making a concession, that is okay, but if there is no counter concession, if there is no response by the other side, right, uh, then you do not keep making concessions. Right? Then you, you, you stand your ground and you uh, argue your case. I think that is, that is very important in terms of a message you're sending. Um, I'm very interested in the answer to Agatha's question. I know a lot of people that would state you have to start negotiations from a high point, absolutely. Huh? Uh, so. The, your anchor should be on top of 
what we call the, the ZOPA, the zone of possible agreement, so the zone in which a negotiation takes place. Uh, and of course, their information is critical. The more you can find out about that zone, uh, the, the better information is power, the better you can anchor, you can throw the anchor, and you should always throw it just above the highest point of the negotiations for the simple reason that that gives you a chance to reach your best possible result. Because you should always leave some room for maneuver. You should always leave some room for negotiation. Something you can invest in the relationship. You should always add, make that little extra. At the same time, a very clear advice uh, that we can give you from best best practices is really, and, and I can give you from my own experience, is really uh, that you should never say yes to a first proposal. So very often, if the first proposal is OK, people feel like it's a quick win, it's an easy win. Huh? Uh, but if the relationship matters, if the relationship doesn't matter, then it, it is not important. But if, if you have a longer term negotiation and the parties still have to deal with each other afterwards, then interestingly enough, uh, if your first offer is accepted, you usually feel frustrated afterwards. You feel you could have gotten more. Uh, so anchor high enough, but do not refuse ever the first offer of the other side, uh, two sides of the coin that are uh, relevant. Okay. Anything else? You can almost see your negotiation framework as your aspiration, what would you like to get, your bottom line, until where do you want to go, huh? and your BATNA, what am I going to do outside of the negotiation if there is no uh, cooperative response. And then within that, that ZOPA, that zone of possible agreement, what are some concessions I'm going to make? And in order to make them smartly, what is the logic of my concessions? If you make concessions without explanations, they will backfire because people feel, why didn't you make them straight away? Why did you ask more to start with? So you need a logic. Under these conditions, if, if, cashment is, if, if, if this sum is, is paid cash, uh, if we can ing include a, a clause on an exemption, eh? whatever, whatever helps you. But there should be a logic to your concession. And within that framework, eh, you try to first understand the other side, read the other side, make sure you don't settle for compromise only, but you try to create value. Think about the example of the orange, and then aim high enough, aim high enough so that you give yourself a chance to do well. And while you're doing that, you also zoom out and you try to look at the bigger picture. What are things I can do away from the negotiation table that make my situation at the table better? Okay, thank you very much, Katja. I see we don't have any further questions so far. Uh, there are still 55 people online, but we get thank you notes already. So uh, uh, thank you very much for uh, your attendance. And uh, yeah, hopefully this is uh, insightful information for your uh, future negotiations. And uh, so we'll be looking forward to see you back in another webinar uh, anytime uh, in the future. And we'll, of course, send you uh, the link to this webinar and the presentation. Okay, thank we you wish very you a much. good day. Bye-bye.